I have Steven Seagal to thank for my career um, in that I studied film at university and then spent several years in the wilderness, as it were, doing various temp jobs, various part-time jobs. Um, I was selling gas cylinders to Welsh caravan parks when I got a call from the Scotsman and I had sent a bunch of sample reviews off to Andrew Eaton, who was the, the art editor there at the time, um, saying, do you have any work, um, please? Um, and he came back and said, we actually need a reviewer to cover London press screenings. And it just so happened that Stephen Seagal's new film, Half Past Dead, was coming out. And the studio had obviously decided this film was so good that they were going to withhold it from the press north of the border to give the other films a chance. So they wanted me to go down to London and see the film and review it. And so my first re published review was Half Past Dead in The Scotsman in about mid-2003, uh, two stars. Um, and that sort of, that, that, that got me into it. That was where I began. So I thank Stephen Seagal most mornings when I get up. And um, I take it that this is now your, you don't have a day job. Nope. This, this is what you do full time. Yeah, this is what I do full time. Um, and that's been for how many years? Uh, it's been uh, for the past four to five years, I think. It was, it was really only in the last couple of years where I have actually started to break even. I think 2012 was the first year that I actually made five figures in the year. Now I'm breaking even. I, you know, I'm not going to retire and live out my days on a yacht in the Indian Ocean. Um, but I cover my bills and I pay my rent and, you know, I, I count myself lucky that I'm in a position to do that because I think a lot of my colleagues are still struggling um, to find paying gigs. Okay, and what, the, what to you does film criticism mean? Like, what are its values? What's it for? Who's it for? For me, it, it's two things. On a, on a sort of macro level, it, it's an ongoing conversation between yourself and the past, you know, what's, what's come before you. And you're, you're often reacting to uh, opinions that have been aired in the past, movies that have, been, that have come before the current crop of movies. You're trying to relate everything as part of, uh, of some kind of continuation. Um, so there, there is this sort of ongoing conversation that you are trying to have with critics of the past and, and hopefully passing on something to the people who will be with critics of the future. Um, on a micro level, I've always written reviews for my friends. You know, I've always written so that if any of my friends comes up to me and says, oh, what's worth seeing? I can immediately sort of come up with a list of three or four things that they should be looking at rather than the one or two things they've seen on the side of a bus or in an ad break or in a trailer that's been circulated on the internet. Um, I have wonderful little moments during my job where I see something and I think, oh, Dan would love this, or, you know, uh, Catherine would be just blown away by this, and I, I can instantly go out and send a text and say, oh, you must go and see this film, you know. And it's about connecting people with films that they might like and, you know, hoping that they, um, on the, the rare nights off that they get, they will spend two hours watching a film that is going to uh, move them in some way rather than watching a, a movie that they've just picked at random, um, that they're not going to connect with in some way. And um, do you regard yourself as a film critic or a film reviewer? And, or do you think there's even a difference or there isn't a difference? I think there's, there's an implied hierarchy there. I think, um, I, I'd imagine critics would look down on reviewers. I think reviewing, um, there is an implication that, that, that there is, reviewers just tell you whether a film is good or bad. Uh, whereas a critic will be able to place a film in some degree of context, with social, historical, cinematic. Um, personally, I see myself as somewhere between the two. I mean, when I'm writing 100 word reviews for The Guardian, you don't get to go into the same kind of depth that you would in a 4,000 word academic essay uh, or a critical essay that would be published in Sight and Sound, say. Um, but I hope that within those 100, 150 words, I can sneak in some sort of semblance of uh, context knowledge, some sign that I, I, I know what I'm talking about. It doesn't always work, but you know, sometimes like, you, that's what I'm aiming for. Uh, there is the sort of entertainment hat where you're watching to see if a film holds your attention for two hours, entertains you, moves you, amuses you. Um, there is the sort of historian hat where you're sitting there thinking, you know, 
is this as good as the films of the past? Does this stack up against the films of the great classics that have come before it? There's also increasingly an element of playing the role of consumer uh, watchdog. You know, I often feel like Linfold's Wood on Watchdog, and, and you get big, expensive movies that are sold to you as the greatest thing that you will ever see. And oftentimes, you're, I, I feel like I'm sitting there going, well, does this live up to the hype? Is this the product that's been sold to me? You know, is it functioning as I would like it to function? Is it damaging? Is it liable to damage anyone in some way? Um, but there, there, there was an aspect of, of, of being a consumer watchdog um, that I think ties in with this whole idea that, that journalism should be um, a, a, an act of public service. You know, you are sort of, uh, you're there almost as a, as a shield against, you know, what, to prevent any damage from occurring on a wider scale or as it were, to take one for the team as it were. Um, in part because I think I grew up reading Empire and reading Leonard Moulton and using Halliwell, so stars were always in the mix for me. You hear sort of rumblings about, no, oh, nobody reads a three-star review. Um, I've heard dark mutterings that uh, there's a leading uh, broadsheet newspaper that doesn't allow its critics to write three-star reviews. They say you have to pick either four stars or two stars. I've seen 8,000 movies. There are three-star movies, you know. And, and you know what? Three-star movie isn't a bad thing. It's, 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 it's a good night in. You know, it's entertaining in some way. It fulfills its purpose. It may not be as exciting as a four-star movie, but it's, it's sure hell better than a two-star movie. I've always found star ratings to be more like guidelines, both for the reader, in that the reader can immediately see whether a film is above average or below par or somewhere in between. It's also a guideline for me as a, as a critic. When I'm sitting there writing the review, I'm thinking, is this a three-star review? Is this a two-and-a-half-star review? And therefore, do I round it down or do I round it up? You're constantly sort of recalibrating your own opinion, your own relationship to the film. And I think that's a healthy thing, you know. Um, but do, do you, does it bother you that, you know, the cliche is that um, many readers never look past the star rating, that that's, that's, that's the only thing they're interested in, and they're not going to actually read those words, you know, that, that you've yeah. committed the page. Um, does that bother you, or...? It sometimes preys on my mind, and particularly because you see... Uh, so many posters that have an avalanche of stars utterly removed from the context of the review. Um, and you can often uh, bet that a lot of those four-star reviews are actually slightly more sceptical than the, the tone of the advert, so the, the, the tone of the whole ad campaign. Um, the one thing I would say about those posters is that you should never necessarily trust the stars. You should trust the person who's giving the stars. I think the makeup of the critical fraternity, as it is, uh, has changed radically. I mean, I remember back in 2003 when I first walked into the dark Soho screening rooms and saw uh, a panel that was essentially made up of white, middle-aged or elderly men uh, who'd all been to Oxford or Cambridge and... I, as a sort of young punk kid, I kind of felt slightly out of place um, and immediately realised that I would have to sort of buck up my ideas and, and behave and not necessarily sort of giggle during screenings or uh, we couldn't talk amongst ourselves. There was a little group of us, myself, Tim Roby at The Telegraph, Catherine Short, who's uh, at The Guardian. Um, and we formed a sort of little club amongst ourselves. I think the average age of, of critics has now come down, you know, radically in the last... 10 years or so. I mean, that's something to do with the rise of blogging. I think, you know, a lot of young film fans are getting into criticism that way. And uh, if you come to a screening room nowadays, there may be one or two representatives of the old guard there, but I think there are a lot more women there, for one. Uh, there are a lot of um, uh, black and Asian critics, um, all of which, I, you know, lends a different perspective on the films that we're seeing. It shouldn't always be, you know, the, the opinions of middle-aged white guys who've been to Oxford. Nothing against Oxford. And you've mentioned sort of new media and the, the rise of the blogger. Um, and I wonder whether you see new media, um, I mean, I suspect you've already to a degree answered this question, but if you see new media as a, as a good thing or a bad thing overall for film criticism? It's a tool like any other. I mean, you know, I, I use Twitter to bounce ideas off people. It, it, it lends 
the critical conversation a greater immediacy in that I can immediately have a conversation with someone about a movie that we haven't seen and we can link to YouTube clips or, you know, we can uh, fire links at one another all day long. Um, and, you know, sometimes I spitball ideas on Twitter and see what bounces back, um, <laughs> always with success. Um, sometimes I use it just to sort of rant at the end of a screening where I feel particularly pent up. Um, it, it, it helps connect you with your audience a lot more. You know, you can, it, I can immediately fire out my reviews on Friday morning and say, look, here are all the reviews I've written this week, rather than waiting for someone else to publish them and put them into print. If it is competition, I think it's healthy competition. I mean, it forces me to raise my game. I look around at the many other opinions that are out there, and I go, oh my God, he, you know, he or she made an amazing point that I should have got, you know, and I sometimes kick myself, and it forces me to sort of raise my game. Um, I don't necessarily have any issue with the likes of Rotten Tomatoes, for example, the sort of aggregate. So because that, that is essentially for functioning in the same way that something like Halliwell's would. You know, in the, it's rounding up a, a vast amount of information um, in the one place. I mean, the hope would be that anyone who uses Rotten Tomatoes would then click through onto several other reviews and, and, and weigh them against one another and, and, and get those individual opinions, which are much more idiosyncratic than a number on a website. Yeah, I, mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the tomato meter is just like a tiny aspect of, of what Rotten Tomatoes does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It collates a huge amount, a of, huge amount of information. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you choose to pursue that, then there's, there's a rich wealth of <laughs> Yeah, there, and one man's 89% is not another man's yeah. 89%. Yeah. Um, conversely, um, do, you, do you see print journalism as uh, being under threat? Um, do, you, do, you, I mean, do you think it's, it's in its death throes, or what, does it have a good long time, good long life yet ahead of it? Uh, well, the romantic in me would like to believe that when I get on a train at the end of the day and people are commuting back from work, people will still be picking up newspapers and, and reading you know, print media as it as once was. I, I hate the idea that we would all eventually one day end up just staring at screens all day because God knows I think we spend far too much time staring at screens as it is. The realist in me has seen what's happened um, to print journalism over the last 10 years and the disarray that it has been in and continues to be in in some ways. Um, when I started the Sunday Telegraph, we had a full broadsheet page between the two, two main critics. So you'd get the lead reviews and the roundup reviews on the same page, a big broadsheet page. At some point in the noughties, it was decided that we were gonna have a, a spin-off arts magazine. Um, and we would have two pages. So the lead reviews would be on one side, the roundup reviews would be on the other side. And then 2008, the credit crunch happened and all of a sudden everything got squished. Um, and the film pages became a film page uh, in a much smaller format and much more, uh, the magazine became much more beholden, beholden to advertising. Uh, so if an advert came in at the last minute um, that available space would get squished even further. So we went from two pages to one page and then often half a page. And in some absurd cases, there was weeks where the film, uh, the actual reviews took up a quarter of the page. Uh, and obviously the, what happens with that is that you write fewer words and if you write fewer words, you're getting paid less. Um, the first time I was in the Sunday Telegraph, I remember, it was, because it was sort of 2002, it's back when uh, newspaper vendors used to sell their, hawk their wares in Leicester Square on a Saturday night. They used to set up big trestle tables and you could go down at 11, 11.30 at night and pick up the first edition of the Sunday Telegraph or the Observer or whichever newspaper you, you chose to. And I remember the first time my column ran in the Sunday Telegraph, I dashed down to Leicester Square at 11.30 and picked up um, my reviews and there was a, a tremendous feeling of sort of uh, achievement and you know excitement to the fact I finally look mum I finally made it you know um, and, and now I, I buy a newspaper and I see that because there are so many films coming out everything's been cut down to the bare minimum um, and I wonder why would I bother paying to have a print edition which is only containing half of my reviews when I could read my stuff online for free in its entirety. I think we are all going to have to become a good deal more flexible than we are. I think one of the exciting things about this sort of new era for film criticism is that film criticism can take many forms. It can be podcasts, you know, it can be YouTube videos. Um, there are many other ways of doing it. This model where 
um, we all just write for newspapers, and that's that. Um, I think it, that's what's coming under threat. Um, I think there are now many other avenues. This very film that we're recording today is a form of film criticism in that we're regulating ourselves, if you like, or we're discussing our own craft. Um, and so there are, me there are going to be many more, uh, there are obviously going to be many more challenges, but I think you know, the, the, we need to become more flexible. And I think um, if we become more flexible, then hopefully there will be a future for us all. I would hope that the professional critic brings a weight of knowledge that not all amateurs have. Um, you would hope the professional critic has been doing it long enough not to be fooled as easily as I, I sometimes see some amateur critics being fooled, um, whether that be by expensive ad campaigns or, you know, uh, exciting behind-the-scenes superhero stories or... Um, so I would hope that there's a degree of expertise and knowledge and experience that the professional critic brings to their task. What do we need to do? I, all we can do is, is get better, you know. Um, every film that you see gives you an opportunity to improve your craft and, you know, improve your rating system. So, you're con again, you're constantly recalibrating what it is that you're seeing. You're placing everything in context. Um, yeah, I would, I would hope that, that we just learn and get better. <laughs> and uh, one last question. You're, you're, uh, um, uh, this, I'm sorry about the way this is going to be phrased. Um, there's just no other way I can do it. Um, I think the number of films is becoming an issue. I think um, we're sitting here talking now. There were 21 films out the week before last. I think there were 22 films out this coming week. Um, we've reached a point where digital technology has made it incredibly cheap to not only make films, but to distribute films and put films in cinemas. Uh, and it used to be the case that one film critic could see them all. And now that's not possible. Now we require teams of, of critics. So at The Guardian, there are three and four of us. At The Telegraph, there are three of us. Um, and that can be exhausting. It does feel sometimes like we're sitting outside the sluice gates at a sewage factory waiting for the torrent to unleash every week and you know some weeks we we you know we we retrieve a gem and we hold it high and we say my god you must go and see this you know there are often days where you sit there and you come away feeling very smelly and tired you know because you are just getting bombarded with product um and that, that is you know one of the downsides or one of the few downsides of this job um i sometimes wonder whether there's a kind of degree of neoliberalism in that is factored into film criticism that because a film is going to make a huge amount of money, critics think, oh, well, this film is untouchable, so it doesn't necessarily matter if I like it or hate it. I'm just going to wave it through. And there's a degree of shrugging amongst certain critics, particularly when it comes to those big superhero movies, I think. Um, they seem to... Because we know that we're going to get a lot of feedback along the lines of, oh, it's, it's, it's fun, you should enjoy it as fun, and you shouldn't analyse it too much. Um, I, I see certain critics going, well, OK, I'm not going to analyse it this much, I'm just going to wave it through, and they say, oh, well, it's an enjoyable experience if you like seeing cars blowing up, and not actually bothering to engage with any of the themes or anything. And I think that's dangerous, because I, I don't think those films need anybody going to bat for them, necessarily. You know, if they're great, then great, we'll give them a good review, but... Um, they don't need waving through in the way they often are, I think. There are certain films which are touchy subjects and people are so protective of certain franchises and certain characters that you know you're going to get some fairly irrational responses. But at the same time, you might get a perfectly ration, rational argument um, that you hadn't thought about. And again, that's one of the instances where social media helps because you can have an immediate conversation with someone. And if someone's talking to you in a very rational way, I don't mind having that conversation. If someone's saying, oh, you're an idiot, you don't know anything. Uh, I get enough of that in my private life as it is. I don't necessarily need that online. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, that, that is one of the ways in which social media has sort of revolutionized our profession and I think you know getting feedback is a good thing because often we're not getting feedback from our own editors you know we will just fire stuff off and they're so busy they just publish it um and you know so it it is nice to get some feedback even if it is critical of you know of us
now. It, it is much more democratic these days. Everyone's a critic. Everyone has their own opinions, and everyone has an outlet to share those opinions. Um, and I, I certainly don't feel as though I'm sat on top of a mountain proclaiming that this is a great film or a bad film. I'm starting a conversation when I write a review. Um, and you know, sometimes that conversation goes in strange directions. Um, sometimes you say something and people completely agree with you. Um, but it is the beginning of a conversation, not necessarily the end, the full stop. And, um, and you do engage, do you, you do engage with people that comment, as, again, as long as they're being reasonable and not just being abusive, you do, uh, so you will, you will respond to comments? Yeah, you know, because I, I don't feel like I know everything, you know, I, I, I come along quite late in the history of cinema, you know, there are, there are, I often wonder whether critics in the 1950s had an easier time because they only had 50 years of cinema to catch up with, and, you know, now we've got 115 odd years, to, and, you know, it takes time, and there's a lot of TV to watch as well. You know, you, can't, you, 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 you in your spare time, you need time to catch up and, you know, see those classics that you haven't seen in much the same way that there are classic novels that you need to read. And, and you know, there is that, that weight of pressure is often felt, I think. Um, but it's important work and it's an important part of who you are. So if you do see a film that refers back to a silent classic from the 20s or 30s, you know the references. Well, I mean, there is a diversity of opinion there, which I don't necessarily see we were getting in the olden times, as it were. Um, I mean, the strange thing is we do have a history in this country of female film critics. We have C.A. Lejeune and, and Dillis Powell, and, but they, they do seem to be the sort of exception that prove the rules that it is, by and large, a boys' club. And certainly when I started out, it did feel very much like a boys' club to which I had been invited. Um, but I think... As things have changed, things have got more interesting. The conversation has become more complex and more interesting um, in that now we're getting multiple perspectives on the same film. One of the interesting things about seeing Carol Morley's The Falling, which is open this week, is that it is a film made by a woman um, starring mostly actresses um, and dealing with some very key issues about coming of age as a woman. And the responses to that have been very interesting because they've all been in some way quite personal. So I'm sort of, when I give my response, I wonder, well, okay, am I, am I saying this just because I'm a guy or is that in the film? Uh, I've been reading a lot of female critics who've been writing very passionately and intensely about it. Um, and they've had very different responses to it as well. Um, and I think you wouldn't necessarily have got something like that in, in the old days when it was just a handful of middle-aged white guys um, either giving it a collective thumbs up or thumbs down.